In episode six, Warren gets ready to meet Poppy. But right before he goes into the meeting, the guard gives him a shank, telling him that the leader of the Aryan Brotherhood will tell him who that shank is for. He then goes in to meet with Poppy, where she lets him know that the code works. She was able to transcribe the diary. And what she found was that Laney was getting molested by Chuck. And you can tell by his reaction that he really had no idea. He asked Poppy, so you think Laney did it? And she tells him that she actually thinks that Aaron did it. She did it to protect her daughter, and then she coached her daughter into labeling Warren as the killer. Warren tries to figure out why Aaron would do that to him, and Poppy asks him, well, did she act suspiciously leading up to the party? And he tells her that she wasn't really around. She was gone for about a month that September, right before Halloween. And that is something that Poppy can definitely look into. Where did Aaron go? He then heads back to the cell and rereads the letter that Lainey sent him way back in the day, and she actually sent it to him while she was incarcerated in a mental institution. She was apologizing, saying, I feel like you probably hate my guts and you didn't even read this, but I'm all alone too, and I don't want to go back to the real world. She ends it by saying, I love you. Don't write back. Love, Lainey. And the two, right before all this went down, actually had a little bit of a fling where Warren had his first kiss. It's got him thinking a lot about Lainey and that field and that kiss, which is kind of ironic because that day, Lainey and Josie head to that exact field. They used to spend tons of time there. Josie sets it up as a, hey, we used to spend a lot of time here kind of situation. Josie tells Lainey she decided to stay a little bit, and Lainey tries to get Josie to agree to stay with them for the time being. Josie, though, doesn't answer because she just uncorked a bottle of wine and the cork goes flying near a tree. And when the girls go to get it, Josie starts having a weird flashback from their childhood about this tree, about burying a bird, and it's a flashback that she can't really shake. In prison, though, Warren goes to meet the leader of the Aryan Brotherhood to see who he's supposed to shank as a sign when he sees a shirtless white kid walk by who can't be more than 19 years old. Warren thinks he has a pretty good idea of why this kid is shirtless and why the kid is walking with his head down. He himself is having some flashbacks about his first couple nights in San Quentin. And his theories are confirmed when he sees the leader of the Aryan Brotherhood come out from behind a wall, pulling up his pants. Told you, those Aryan Brotherhood guys, they just love their gay prison sex. Warren walks towards the guy, and the guy grabs Warren and jacks him up against the wall while also grabbing at his, uh, let's just say he's doing a Donald Trump impression. And Warren is kind of scared again, just repeating, I didn't see anything. And the guy says, yeah, what exactly was there to see? He then starts belittling Warren, making him feel inferior, and that's when Warren takes out that shank and stabs him. He starts stabbing him over and over, letting him know, whose face do you think I see when I go to bed at night? Warren, though, realizes, I probably shouldn't leave the body here, so he drags it inside a maintenance closet, switches shirts, because his shirt was covered in blood, and then leaves it there. It doesn't take long, though, for the Aryan Brotherhood to wonder where their leader is, and what looks like the second in the command walks up to Warren very suspiciously and asks, do you have any idea where he is? And Warren the whole time is playing dumb, acting like, no, I don't know where he is. I saw him yesterday. But shortly after that, the guards locate the body and everybody goes into lockdown. Because of this, Warren thinks that his time might be coming to an end. So he finagles a way to get a cell phone and calls up Lainey Berman, begging her to come. He tells her, I need to see you before it's too late. And to his utter surprise, she actually shows up. When she sits down, he tells her, I had to get rid of hating you. And that's because I'm going to die in here. He then smashes the letter up against the glass and asks, do you remember writing this to me? And she says, I didn't even think you got it. He tells her how he knows it by heart, and there was only one thing that made him want to keep it. And that's the part where she told him that she loved him. He wants to know if it's true. She starts to try to formulate the words as she kind of hyperventilates a little bit, saying, nothing I can say right now can help you. She starts to try to talk again, but Warren just says, don't. And he starts to repeat some of the letter, and she actually finishes it, so... She definitely remembers it. She then puts her hand up against the glass and he follows suit. And that's when he says, you should have told me about your father. And Lainey pulls back, kind of embarrassed. And she starts to get confrontational about it, yelling at him, you think you have the missing piece to the whole mystery now? He cuts her off, though, and says, if I had known, I would have killed him myself. He then lets her know that she is still the only girl he's ever kissed. And she tells him, you are still the only boy I've ever loved. At this point, Warren is crying and nodding. But then he asks the big question, then why did you lie about me? And unfortunately for Warren, that's one too many questions for Lainey, and Lainey hangs up the phone as Warren screams for an answer that he's never going to get. Now, all this time, Poppy started digging into where Aaron went in that month. She had Marcus look into it, and Marcus found that she was arrested for drunk driving and was ordered to go to rehab in August of 99. So that's where she was. Poppy thinks, well, if she was fresh out of rehab, she might have been actually sober that night, but Marcus reminds her, that's a big if. I know a lot of alcoholics that as soon as they get out of rehab, they go right to the liquor store. So now they need to visit the rehab to find out if the sobriety actually stuck. When they go there, though, they get stonewalled because the place isn't going to give them information on past clients. But she is able to find out who Aaron's sobriety coach was. 
And when Poppy interviews the sobriety coach, the sobriety coach told her that she was stone cold sober when she called in a rage because Chuck was looking at Melanie. She also lets her know that Aaron was on a drug that would make her throw up if she drank alcohol. And she was on this drug the night of the murder. Which begs the question, if she was sober the night of the murder, then why did she lie to the police? And in order to get more information about it, Poppy decides to head and talk to Alex, Lainey's husband. Now, at first, Alex tries to stonewall her, but that's when Poppy says if you want Aaron out of your life, and more importantly, your life back with Lainey, then help me fill in the gaps and get closer to Aaron. The only information, though, that Alex really has for her is the fact that they had to bail Aaron out of jail the week she came home. She broke into their old house, and the new owners had to call the police when they found her. You would think all of this information Marcus would have seen on her police record, but he didn't, but it's new information nonetheless. So Marcus and Poppy head to the old house, which is surrounded by true crime enthusiasts thanks to Poppy's new podcast, and the owners show them where they found Aaron. It was in the basement of their house. She snuck in through a bathroom window that wasn't connected to their alarm system. That right there leads Poppy to believe this isn't the first house that Aaron's broken into. They asked the owners, what did she do when you caught her? And they say that Aaron laughed and then apologized and said that she was feeling nostalgic. They were creeped out by it. Now, there was nothing missing or stolen, but there was what looks like a furnace open that wasn't open before. So it was obvious that Aaron was looking for something. Marcus and Poppy then head back to the office and meet up with Noah and start hypothesizing on what she could have been looking for, and they figure it must have been the murder weapon that was never found. This makes perfect sense to Noah. She hid the knife before the cops came, and once this podcast came out, she needed to go back and get it because she's now afraid that Poppy's going to figure out that she did it. Marcus also finds this interesting, that for 20 years, Aaron stayed away, but as soon as the podcast started, she came back to cover her tracks. The only issue, Poppy says, is the fact that she never found the murder weapon, because there was nothing on her when they arrested her. Poppy knows that Aaron is impulsive and nervous, so she figures she needs to smoke her out. And she instills the help of the owners of the former house to call up Aaron and tell her, hey, we found what you were looking for. And when Aaron stops by, they say, yeah, we found what you were looking for deep in the old furnace. Give us five grand and it's yours or we're going to the police. Aaron demands to see it, but they don't hand it over. So she says, okay, then what was it? And they say, a knife? And Aaron just chuckles and leaves. The owners call Poppy and tell her what happened. And this played out exactly as Poppy expected. It confirms what Poppy already believed, that Aaron is guilty because she showed up in the first place. And now, at least they know that they're not looking for a knife. After this meeting, though, Aaron went back to the house and got ripped, where Josie found her drunk on the floor. And once she actually becomes sober, Josie kind of yells at her a little bit because of the fact that she found her adult mother drunk again. Aaron then turns it on Josie, asking her what she's planning on doing now that her fiancé left her, and Josie says, I don't know. Aaron then changes the subject, telling Josie, I tried to protect you. And once she says this, Josie gets a rush of flashbacks from her mother burning letters as her and her sister watch. And these memories make Josie uncomfortable, so she answers Aaron's previous question, telling her, yeah, I think I'm going to stay in Menlo Park for a while. And Aaron thinks this is great because it'll be great for Lainey. Aaron tells Josie, maybe I can come home for Christmas, which is the first time that Josie is hearing that her mom's leaving. And Josie asks her mom, why don't you just stay? Take this time to clean yourself up, start over. Josie then takes another turn in the conversation, telling her mom, you know, I left you guys for 17 years, thinking that it would help. But no matter how many miles I put between us, I'm still just that scared, stupid teenage girl. I don't think any of us ever left that hallway where dad died. I've already said goodbye to enough people in my life, and I can't do it anymore, and neither can you. So, stay. And as Aaron is crying, she kind of nods a yes. Later in the day, Aaron gets a phone call from a very unlikely person, Melanie. She walks in to see that Melanie is in fact dying, where Melanie tells her that dying people like to make amends. They start reminiscing about how they used to be the queens of the neighborhood, and Melanie quips, <laughs> too bad we didn't know how good we had it, but Aaron says, I did. Until you fucked my husband. And Melanie admits that, yes, yeah, sleeping with your husband was definitely bad. And Aaron says, that doesn't sound like much of an apology, but Melanie tells her, that's as close as you're going to get. As Aaron gets up to leave, Melanie says, you know, it was purifying for me to face my demons. You might want to do it too. And that's when Poppy pops out of the room and surprises Aaron. And Aaron is completely taken off guard with Melanie telling Aaron, I know you lied about my son. And she screams at her, just tell the damn truth. But instead, Aaron just flees the house. As she's trying to get to her car, Poppy's following her and says, you knew Chuck was abusing Lainey. That's motive. Aaron demands to know who told Poppy that, and Poppy tells her it was Lainey. And Aaron actually tries to say, well, she doesn't know what she's talking about. That's when Poppy tells her that she also knows about the drugs that would make her throw up if she was drinking and she was on on the night of the murder. Add in all of this and the fact that she was hunting for the murder weapon, it's pretty damning. Poppy says, I think when you were in rehab, alone and sober, it was tough for you, knowing what your husband was doing to your daughter the entire time. It must have eaten you up knowing that it all happened under your roof while you were stuck in a bottle. 
Aaron tells her, I didn't kill my husband, but Poppy says, I know you did. I'm putting the piece together and the picture looks real bad for you. But I can help because all those articles that I wrote 19 years ago got Warren tried as an adult. That shows my words have power. Now, do you want that power wielded against you or to help you? Because I'm doing the next episode with or without you. But just know, I'm the difference between the world seeing you as a cold-blooded murderer or a loving mother who would do anything to protect her daughter. And it doesn't take long for Aaron to see the light and say, All right, I'll give you your interview. But I need some time. And the two agree to meet at Susan's the next morning. Poppy then heads to the cemetery where her mother is buried and she meets up with her father. They start reminiscing about Poppy's mom, but then Shreve gets to the real reason why he asked Poppy there. It's to tell her that he has CTE. Now, it's not proven because the doctors won't know until he's actually dead, but he's pretty positive. He's just forgetting things, and he's scared of what he will become. And that's what Poppy did after leaving her little impromptu meeting with Aaron. Aaron, on the other hand, ended up calling Lainey, who is in a very emotional state after her meeting with Warren. And the first thing Aaron does is kind of yell at Lainey for telling Poppy about the fact that Chuck was abusing her. She then asks Lainey, all right, where is it? Because it's not in the storage space. It's not in the old home. And Lainey actually, she doesn't know what she's talking about. And that really annoys Aaron. She says, all right, I'm done. I can't take this anymore. I'm going to talk. I'm going to tell the truth. And I'm going to tell her everything that I know. Maybe this way I can fix things the right way. Lainey cuts her mom off and says, just stay at Aunt Susan's. I'll be right over. We can talk about this. So Lainey heads over there and tells her mom, we'll do the interview together. We'll get this over with. But as her mom is sipping some wine, Lainey pulls out three pills. And she tells her mom that they're painkillers. And Aaron wants to chew those bad boys up like they're M&Ms. She gives all three of them to Aaron and Aaron downs them with the wine. And shortly after that, Aaron collapses, and it's important to remember what Lainey does for a living. She's a death doula. She literally helps people die. And after Aaron collapses, she basically goes into work mode, putting her mom in bed and saying everything's fine, but everything is clearly not fine with Aaron. You get the impression that what she took wasn't exactly painkillers. And finally with Poppy, she recorded her latest episode, but afterwards she heads over to Lainey's house. When Alex answered the door, he says, Lainey's not here right now. And that's because Lainey was over at Susan's house. Emma comes running downstairs, though, with a church fan from Poppy's house that she was actually looking for. It belonged to her mother. So when Emma comes running downstairs with it, Poppy's a little taken aback and says, where did you get that? And that's when Emma says, mommy gave it to me. Thanks for checking out this recap. Please consider subscribing to this channel. Like the video if you liked it. Hit thumbs down if you don't. Be nice in the comments section. Nasty comments hurt my feelings. I work hard on these. If I make a mistake, it happens. If you don't see the next video up in the end screen, it'll be up soon. Sharing is caring. Put it on your MySpace page or your away message. And check out my podcast, Scene Invaders, wherever you listen to podcasts.